Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, welcome to the AI DRC Technican uh, seminar series. Today we have our uh, special guest, Professor Ami Piansen. I think everybody knows him, and uh, he will give us an interesting talk today. But uh, before the talk, I would like to uh, briefly, as a routine, briefly introduce Professor Ami Institute of Technology, Stockholm, Sweden. Is an attribute fellow, teacher future fellow, and Wallenberg uh, Academy fellow. He has a podcast and a YouTube channel called Wireless Future. I think many people follow the channel and uh, learn a lot from the channels. His research focuses on multi antenna communication and uh, resource and the radio resource allocation is methods from communication theory, simple system, and machine learning. He has also the three textbook and uh, published a lot. A month of uh, simulation code is uh, pushing for the reproducibility of research work. And uh, he has received the 2018 and the 2022 AAA Marconi Prize Paper Award in Wireless Communications and the 2019 UNOSIP uh, Early Career Award and the 2019 AAA Communication Society Fred W. Elasic Prize, the 2019 AAA Sing uh, Singapore Season Magazine. It's a paper. Best Economy Award and the 2022 Piri Simon Napna's Early Career Technique Achievement Award and the 2020 CTTC Only Achievement Award and the 2021 IEEE Kamsok RCC Only Achievement Award. He has received six Best Paper Award at conference. And uh, my, okay, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is uh, Jiguan He, and I'm a senior researcher here at uh, AI and the Digital Science Research Center at TRI. And for the talk, it's well uh, last uh, around uh, one hour, and uh, like uh, in, including 50 or 55 uh, talk and uh, uh, 10 minutes of Q&A. So, you are welcome to write down your question during the presentation of uh, Professor Amy Bianson. You can write down your, your questions. We will come back to that at the end of uh, the, his talk. So Professor Amy Bianson, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so it, it's great to see that there is already a lot of people here in the room. It seems to be stabilizing a number of attendees. So I think I could get started with sharing my screen. So thank you very much for, for the, the invitation. And uh, I'm happy to talk about some of the, the new things that we have been working on in my group. Uh, uh, and I will try to do this in a sort of overview fashion that we should be accessible to, to a lot of our people, I hope, uh, and focus on, on some of the insights uh, that we have obtained from trying to make sure that these reconfigurable intelligent circus, uh, surfaces would be useful also in practical scenarios and not in scenarios only that are of theoretical value. So, so that is what I will be focusing this talk on. So the outline is that I will give a very brief overview of what is reconfigurable intelligent surface from my perspective. And in particular, that will lead up to a, a system model that I will be then utilizing for the rest of the talk. And I will describe how you would learn the channels in, uh, so that we can configure an RAS in the right way, because this is one of the main practical challenges. In particular, that we will need a large amount of resources for doing this, unless we can do something clever. And this is what I will then spend some time talking about, how one can use subarrays to control the pilot length that we have and optimize it based on how big package of data we'll transmit. And also how we can utilize channel geometry to vastly reduce the amount of pilots that we are requiring. If we, for example, use some kind of parametric maximum likelihood estimation methods. And uh, for people who have seen seeing me talking about all kinds of various things on, for example, YouTube in the past, or different conferences. All the results that I will be uh, talking about here are published last year or will be published this year. So, so this is really new things that I have extracted insights from. So just to set the scene, let's talk about what has been happening with wireless communications over the past decades. 
So this is typically how a uh, 4G system look like, or, and also 3G and so on. We have sector antennas at base stations that are focusing signals in a particular uh, sector that we would like to uh, serve from our base station perspective. So focus energy down to earth where people are and in a particular maybe 120 degree sector. And that ensure that users that happen to be in that sector and see the base station, they get the strong signal. And users, unfortunately, that are not in that sector, maybe this user was supposed to be in the sector, but there's a big blocking object in between. This user is not benefiting from this directivity at the base station. In fact, it's losing because the way to reach this user would be for the signal to go in a different direction than the, the sector, bouncing on some object and then make it around the corner here and uh, diffusely scatter it in the direction of where the user is. So this is someone who is not benefiting at all from this classical way of building base stations. In 5G, we now have this adaptive multi-user beam forming that we call massive MIMA, for example, which allows us to change the directivity at the base station. And we can now make it even more directive because we can change it and fine tune it depending on where the user is. So for example, we can point one beam towards this user and another beam, the red beam towards this building and then let it scatter around the corner to reach this user. But the user will still have the issue that we can only be creative in how we're transmitting from the base station side. We cannot control what happens after the signal have left the base station. And this is what we then hope that we can do in 6G. We can deploy some objects on top of buildings, for example, to control how waves are interacting with the environment. And in this case, maybe bend the signal so it gets focused towards the user. This is what we would like to achieve in the future. And what will be the reasons for this? Well, to extend coverage in an example like this, but also improve other things in communication channels, like the rank of a channel, in terms of how many data streams we can send in different spatial directions. Maybe this object can create new strong dimensions that we can transmit extra data. And we can shape interference or shape other things. There's a uh, large variety of different things that we can use this for. But it is the coverage extension scenario that I will be covering in particular here. So what is then reconfigurable intelligent surface? Well, here is a schematic description of things. You have a user here, transmit the signal with no particular directivity. We have a blocking object, we have a base station, and we would like the signal to go around this blockage here. And in order to do that, we would need to have some object that can reflect the signal. And this is what this reconfigurable intelligent surface or RES is doing. And it contains a number of elements. These are small patches that is reflecting the signal with no particular directivity but we can control them in terms of uh, their impedances. And the coloring here is indicating that the impedance have different values, leading to that the signal is being phase shift by different elements to different extents. So yellow here is plus pi and blue is minus pi, and we have a variety of different values. Here. And then you see it wraps around here. Uh, so what this is really meaning is that different parts of the surface is shifting the signal to different amounts before it gets reflected. And this is a way of electronically shaping what would happen if you are taking an object and you just change its shape. Because it's usually the shape of the object that is determining how it reflects the signal. And now we're changing the shape electronically by changing the space shift. And this way we can synthesize an object with having other electrical properties in this way, uh, in particular, we would like it to look like a mirror that would be reflecting the signal towards the base station like this. So this is what we like to achieve. And in order to achieve this, channel state information or CSI is key because if we, even if we have this capability of electronically shaping how the surface looks like for radio waves, we need to know how we want it to look like in order to reflect the signal towards the right location. And if we have n elements here, we need to pick n different face values in order to uh, determine how this uh, yeah, surface should look like. And that can be the dimensionality problem. 
if n is at the order of hundreds, well, then you have hundreds of parameters to determine. So just to showcase that this is something that is actually possible to build, here is a experiment that we were doing in China a few years ago. So at the rooftop here, we put out a transmitter with a horn antenna sending a signal 50 meters here towards a copper plate. And it's almost uh, yeah, zero degree that it's incident to this uh, copper plate. So the signal will bounce back and not very much will reach into this uh, receive antenna here that's also pointing towards this one, but not in the same direction. So in this setup, here we are showing the signal that we are receiving in different dBm values. And it's the 5.8 gigahertz band. We have 20 megahertz of spectrum and we use certain transmit power. And these two boxes here, these are these 20 megahertz. So 10 megahertz, 10 megahertz. And you see that there is some signal and that outside the band there is some noise, but you barely see the difference between the signal and noise. Now, we take this copper plate and we replace it with a reconfigurable intelligence surface with 1,100 elements. And we configure these ones, not in an, any optimal mathematical manner, but in a way that works. <laughs> and uh, you just, we describe the simple way of doing it in this paper. And what you can see is that we were now receiving 27 dB more power at the receiver side here. So within the band, we have a strong signal outside the band, we have some out of band uh, distortion and then uh, or leakage, and then we have some noise here. So this is just an illustration of that this is something we could build. The way that we operated this was that we very slowly were changing the configurations here and we measured the signal strength and figured out if things were better or not. And it was a static scenario, so we can let this take many minutes to converge to this solution. So how would we do something like this in practice is one of the main questions. So RS configuration channel estimation in a nutshell, how does it work? Here's a basic system model. I have a transmitter with one antenna. I have a receiver with one antenna. I will focus on that scenario all the time here to keep the math simple. Uh, however, we have a surface with N elements. So from transmitter to each of these elements, there is a channel coefficient, G1 to Gn that is describing the amplitude and phase shift that this channel is providing us to where, as we are going from, from one uh, from transmitter to each of these elements. From each element to the receiver, there is also a channel coefficient, H1 to Hn, describing amplitude and phases when the signal is leaving the, uh, the element um, until it reaches the receiver. And inside each element, the, there will be a phase shift. And we call this theta one to theta n. And these are the ones that we can control in order to determine how this signal makes it from the transmitter to the receiver. Mathematically, it looks like this. So the receive signal y, a scalar, is a summation over all of my elements. And for element n, we have the channel from the transmitter to the RS, gn, from the RS to the uh, receiver, hn, and the phase shift within this RS element, number n. And all of these things are added up. It's multiplied with the data signal x that we are transmitting, which has a certain power, I would call it pd. And we add some receiver noise with sigma square as the variance. So this is our signal mode. If we now would like the signal that is received at the receiver side to become as large as possible, it is this signal uh, factor here in front of X that we would like to make big. So an achievable rate in the system like this would be log two a one plus the gain of the channel, transmit power divided by noise power. And this gain is then this summation in absolute value square. And now you can write this in different ways depending on what you like to achieve. Because it's a summation and summation over different factors here is often possible to write as an inner product or dot product between vectors. The problem is that we have three different vectors that we are dealing with and not two. So what do we do? Well, some people like to take one of these ones and put them in a diagonal matrix and then multiply with vectors from the other side. That will result in this summation. What I will do here, because it fits our purposes better, 
it is to first take an element wise product between G and H like this, and then take in a product with a space shift vector that is equivalent. So we have this representation here. If we now would like to make this gain of the channel as large as possible, what should we do? Well, we have an inner product between two vectors. How do we make an inner product as large as possible? Well, we would like vectors to be aligned. That is what the Cauchy's function and quality is saying. If they point in the same direction, we get the maximum value. And in this case, that means that for every entry in H times G, we would like theta to have the same phase shift. So they are canceling out each other. And we then let theta n be equal to the argument of H times GN. And in this way, we get the maximum value, uh, which is just to sum up the absolute values on these terms here. And we can write this the one norm like this. And the important thing is that if we have n elements here, we are summing up n terms and we square it. So we have something that is at the order of n square. So this is the main thing here. We get the gain that is proportional to the square of the number of elements. Therefore, it pays off a lot to have many RS elements. In order to do this configuration, we need to know H times D, which is known as the cascaded channel. We don't necessarily know every aspects of it. We need to know the faces of each of these entries so that we can pick theta to match that. And in that way, uh, make sure that they are adding up constructively all these paths. So how can we then learn the channel, this cascaded channel? And the problem now is that the RES is blind. It is reflecting the signal to another place with a certain configuration. We can change this configuration, but we can't receive anything. So how can we learn the channels? Well, there's two main approaches that are described. And one of them is to say, well, why not add a few active antennas inside of this RES? So this would be... Uh, elements that can actually receive the signal, estimate the channel uh, from the transmitter, and then utilize this to figure out how we should configure this. And this is something that's possible to do. You can find a lot of literature on this. Uh, you, you can utilize a lot of multi-antenna estimation methods that already existed for decades to uh, and combine them with this new kind of configurations. But one of the main selling points with this RES that tells us that we should put up an RES instead of a new base station at this location is that we want it to be low cost. And if we now have an RES with, say, 200 elements, and you say that 5% of these ones should be actual receive antennas, then you still need 10 antennas in this RES, which start to become a big number. So why don't we have a MIME array already? So this is not the approach that I believe in. You can do it. It just takes away the entire point with building a technology that would be low cost, low energy, because you all of a sudden need a lot of um, active components. The other approach is a codebook based approach uh, where you send pilots. So the idea is that you have a user device that repeats the same signal over and over again. The RES is reflecting the signal with different configurations, which might be predefined or, or might not be predefined, but uh, at least it's something that is known. You switch between these things, you are obtaining uh, the received signal at the base station, you solve some optimization and estimation problem, and then you tell the RES what configuration to use while we are receiving data. And this is the approach that we will be considering now. So mathematically, it works like this. So this, this system model that we had before, a received signal is a product between this cascaded channel and the configuration vector. We have a transmitted signal and we have noise. And now I add this subscript L here on the signals, the noise, and the configuration because I would like to change the configuration with time and then the noise will also change. So what we do is that L times, we are transmitting a known signal with the known power, PP, uh, so P pilot. And for this occasion, we transmit with different configurations. And I put this as columns of a matrix, B. 
So this is an N times L matrix, N because I have N entries. So there are N configurations, uh, yeah, phase shifts in each configuration vector, and then I have L of them like this. If I now take the received signal at these different locations, and I stack them in a vector of length L, I can write the whole thing as this vector expression. The uh, cascade channel is over here. Here is the transmit power from the pilots. Here is the configuration matrix B. Here is the noise. All right. I would now like to estimate the channel. And how could I, I do this? Well, there is a variety of different estimation methods that can be considered. And one of them is the maximum likelihood estimation method, where we look at what would be the probability density function of the received signal if we knew the channel. And this is this, that configuration. Uh, so the probability density function of y, if we know h and g, the only thing that is random is my noise here. Let's assume it's complex Gaussian distributed with sigma square as the variance. Well, then if I take y and subtract this part here, in that case, I will have something that's complex Gaussian distributed. So I will have this probability density function. The maximum likelihood estimator approach is then to say, I should pick the value of h times g, which gives me the maximum likelihood, meaning the maximum value of this probability density function. So I look for all possible g vectors. Uh, sorry, it should not only be, be g, it's h times g vectors um, that is maximizing this value here. And uh, then maximizing this function is the same thing as minimizing the norm that we have up here in the exponent, like this. So I find the HMG vector that's maximizing this. And that turns out to that we should just solve this as an equation. So we take Y, multiply with the pseudo inverse of B. So we get this vector on its own. And then we divide with the square root of P and this is the solution. So this is the maximum likelihood estimator. It's also known as a least square estimator. The thing is that we can use pseudo inverses here in whatever case that we have here. For, even if we only have one pilot, uh, we can do this. The problem is that it only works well if we have as many pilots as we have um, dimensions. So the pseudo inverse is more like a real inverse. And when you have a configuration, I mean, uh, or an RES, I was describing a scenario where we have over a thousand elements. But if we have a hundred, even in that case, you need hundreds of pilots. And can we really afford that in practice is the main question. Because, for example, the channel is changing. We might only send a limited amount of data. There's a lot of resources taken by this. So this is what we really need to deal with if we want this to be something that we can use in other scenarios than the static ones. So I will talk about two ways of reducing the pilots in this type of systems. And the first one is based on thinking about what is it that we are transmitting real systems. We are transmitting packets that are not infinitely large. They have a fixed size. And one of the results that I was talking about earlier was that when we have configured an RES perfectly, the signal to noise ratio becomes proportional to the number of elements squared. So that was this order n squared that I talked about earlier when setting up the models. And why does this happen? Well, the transmitter is first sending a signal towards the RS. And now I have single antenna transmitter and receiver. The reason that I get the first of these ends is an aperture gain, namely that the surface is larger and therefore it collects more energy, just as a solar panel collects more energy when it's larger. So the energy collected by the RES is proportional to its size. So that's why it becomes linear now. The second thing is that when I take my RES and configure it correctly to beam form towards the receiver here, then the more elements I have, the larger the RES is, the more focused the beam form becomes. So I have a beam forming gain proportional also to the size of the RES. And this aperture gain always happens. 
Well, the beam form again comes from that we actually configured the RES in the right way. So this is the way, part that is requiring CSI. So maybe there is a way of still getting the full aperture again, but trade away a little bit of the beamform again in order to save pilot resources. And that is what we were looking to. So here was, is an example. 450 reflecting elements is what you can see here if you would count all of them. And you have 450 different phase shifts on these elements between uh, yeah, pi and minus pi. So therefore we need 450 pilots in order to estimate all of these channel dimensions and figuring out what phase shift to assign. But as, as you can see here, the phase shift is actually changing gradually. So maybe we could instead divide RAS into subarrays, similar to what is done in base stations of today, uh, where you say all of these 25 elements here, five by five, needs to use the same configuration. We limit ourselves like that. And we do this in subarray by subarray. They have the same coloring here. And you can see, compare to the left hand side, it's sort of a sampled version of the same pattern here, but it's not as refined in this case here. So here we have 18 subarrays with 25 elements each that multiplies after 450. So we get the total of 18 subarrays, 18 piles into what we need to transmit. So this is the only thing that is needed here, a massive reduction, 25 times reduction in the number of pilots. In general, what happens here is that, say that we have M elements in our RAS, and we create N subarrays of them, each containing then M divided by N elements. The SNR gain that we should expect to get, I call it G of M, it's a function of M, because we will change the number of subarrays on the next slide should be approximately proportional to m times n because we get n times aperture gain from the transmitter to the RS. And then when we are doing the beam forming, if we are only configuring n subarrays, we only get the beam forming gain proportional to m, at least in the worst case. Uh, that is what's going to happen. But the good thing is that the pilot length is now only proportional to m instead or equal to m. To be strict, it's equal to n plus one because we always have one additional path that goes directly from transmitter to receiver, even if it's weak, that we need to configure as well. So now we have this flexibility of choosing what n needs to be because we might have the hardware to configure every element uh, on its own, but not necessarily the amount of signaling in order to afford doing it. So let's look at the scenario here. Once again, the transmitter sends a signal to a base station via an RES. The RES can be divided into N subarrays. It has a fixed number of elements, but the subarrays is something we can collect, uh, decide on. We have a blocking element uh, here, but there is still some signal get that goes through. And in a practical scenario, this user will likely transmit a payload with a certain number of S uh, modulation symbols from some QAM modulation. And before you are transmitting, we will send a pilot sequence, a known sequence that allows the base station to decode the signal and to configure the RS. And our design goal here is now to let the user uh, transmit with as little energy as possible to convey this message. So you like to minimize the energy consumption at the user. And there are two parameters we will change, the number of subarrays and how much power we are using when we are transmitting our pilots. There are now three different factors that we will be considering. The first is that we are sending a pilot of length n plus one, one to estimate a direct channel and n to estimate all of the paths through the subarrays. And we have a pilot power, then I divide with the bandwidth here in order to uh, turn this into energy. Then I transmit a pilot, a payload of length S. I need a certain data power, P, and a divide with the bandwidth in order to get its energy. And computing this data power, this is based on that in order to deliver this payload properly, you would need a certain SNR so that we get a certain bit error rate, for example, or packet error rate. And when you have specified what SNR you need in order to convey this packet, you have an equation, SNR should be equal to your 
data power divided by the sigma square as a noise power times this gain that you are getting through your res for a particular number of uh, um, subarrays and actually this is also a function of the pilot power so we can solve this in order to figure out what data power it is so that is why we are not needing it as a parameter and finally we have a factor here which says we need to send s plus m plus one times and there is a circuit power to just have the r hardware turn on as well we can now uh, for certain parameters here which are mentioned in this paper down here solve this problem and here's an example of this so we have a transmitter we have a receiver we have a channel uh, via an res here we call it uh, the strength of the channel alpha so it's really fading but it has this alpha as a path loss minus 80 db from the rs to the receiver we have another value beta minus 60 db so it's closer to the receiver there is a 1024 elements in the rs and we have a direct path here, rho would be weak, but not zero. Here I show an example where the direct path here is minus 110 dB, and we are sending a package of length 200. So that is typically what we, in massive IMA literature, call a coherence block. So that is the typical time frequency interval where the channel would be fixed. So putting a packet there makes good sense. And this 3D graph is now showing subarrays and pilot power and energy consumption. So you can see that we would like the energy consumption to be low. And as we are increasing the number of subarrays, meaning that every subarray is smaller, then we get smaller energy consumption until it reaches a maximum or minimum, and then it goes up again slowly. And when we increase the pilot power, there is also a particular value that is the maximum uh, or minimum, sorry, and then it goes up again. In this case, we have a minimum value at n equal to 403. Uh, the problem is that when you divide subarrays, you need to divide them into uh, sort of sections that are equal size. So if you are looking at something that is uh, dividable, actually the minimum is rather at 256, which would mean that we create subarrays with four elements each, and we have then 256 pilots that we need to transmit. So we are finding the way of minimize the energy consumption in order to send this packet and it's not to send one pilot per element if we are having a very static channel and we maybe have a better channel between transmitter and receiver we send 10,000 symbols all of a sudden we have a different shape and the minimum is now achieved with the number of subarrays being equal to 1024 which means that each one of them contains one element so in these cases with long data packets we would have we can spend enough resources to learn the channel for every rs element and this is this general principle then if we transmit a short packet or if the channel is fixed for a very short period of time we can only afford sending short pilots and therefore we need to group the elements together and use the subarray approach while if you're transmitting large packets and the channel stays uh, fixed for that long time, we can afford to send long, large pilots and therefore configure the RS for a long time in order to save energy through a long data transmission. And yeah, this short, short, large, large might make you uh, seem like a very obvious conclusion. If you actually go into the math here, there is also alpha, beta, rho, or all of them affecting when this happens and how this curves are looking like. The next thing I would like to talk about is how to exploit channel geometry to reduce the pilot length much lot, uh, much more. Because before, if you just had enough resources, well, we would like to estimate uh, all of the configurations element by element. But there are scenarios where you don't need that ever. And to give you the sense of why, what we are looking for here, consider a line of sight scenario um, or non line of sight scenario. We see the trade off between these things. So here I have a transmitter, I have a receiver. They are 200 meters apart from each other, and there is a non line of sight channel between them. So it's a large amount of frequency selectivity. Between transmitter and the RS, which is uh, one half a meter by half a meter, we have also 200 meters. It's line of sight or non line of sight. And then we have a user in a room here uh, close to the RES. 
and this line of sight channel. So we can view this as the outdoor base station that is reaching an RES that is then serving user, which is indoor. And we will switch between having a line of sight or non-line of sight channel between transmitter and receiver and, uh, and the RES and And here are two curves for this. In the left curve here, I have a line of sight channel from transmitter to the RES and from the RES to receiver, meaning that we have really one strong angular direction to the RS and one from the RS to the receiver. And this is the one that the RS would like to be configured to reflect the signal as a mirror in that way, but it should be configured so it sort of rotates things in the right way. And here I'm showing what happens to the rate as I'm increasing the bandwidth from one megahertz up to 50 megahertz. And the problem that is arising when you're using an RES in a scenario with a large, and this is not very much bandwidth, but when you have more and more bandwidth, is that you can't change the configuration on a per subcarrier basis. You need to have one configuration that is used for an entire frequency band. The red upper bound is what you achieve in the idealistic case where you could actually optimize the RES per subcarrier. And you see, as you increase the bandwidth, the rate increases linearly. If I optimize the RES in a way where you're sort of just figuring out what is the main angular direction and reflecting the main angular direction, you get the dashed black curve, which is very close. So actually in this line of sight to and from scenario, you, uh, it, it is enough to, uh, to estimate the line of sight components and then the configuration would work very well and close to the idealistic case. While if you let the RES just behave as a metal sheet, reflect things as a mirror would do, you get a much worse performance. But if I now take away the line of sight path and only keep some reflecting objects around some diffuse scattering, then what happens is that the rates on this curve here to the right drops very much. So the top value is much smaller. The red curve is much closer to the case with the metal sheet and the optimized RES is very close to the metal sheet as well. So you don't really benefit from the RES at all like this. So the point that I want to make here is that I think that in the scenarios where RES makes sense to use in practice, you need to have a line of sight from the transmitter to the RES, from the RES to the receiver. Uh, and in those scenarios, there is a lot of structure that we can utilize. And that is what we would like to do. So consider such a scenario here again. I have a user sending a signal to a base station and I have an RS with N elements. The channel from the user um, would be like a plane wave that is reaching an RS. And this channel is unknown from the beginning because the user might be anywhere. And the channel goes from the user directly towards the uh, base station, maybe through some object that is blocking it, most of it. This is also an unknown channel. But the RF and the base station are at fixed locations. So it makes good sense that we are able to learn what that channel is. So we suppose now that we know the H channel. Okay, the signal is the user is now in line of sight to the RS. So we can actually represent this channel using an angle. Uh, so we have a plane wave coming in from that particular angle. It might be a two dimensional angle for the viewpoint of the RS, asymptotical and elevation angle, but the channel have a particular structure that we will use at the moment. The received signal, at the base station looks very similar to what I had before. Why is the receive signal when I'm transmitting L pilots? I have the B, which is my configurations uh, that I'm using during the pilot transmission. I have this cascaded channel where G is the path that I don't know and H is what I know. I have this direct path B and it's the same for all of the pilot uh, the configuration that I'm using. So that's why I write D times a one here. That's a vector with only ones. I'm a pilot power and add some noise. And to make this nicer in my derivations, I can also transform H into a diagonal matrix with H1 to HN on the, the uh, diagonal elements. And then I have G written as a vector here, multiply with this matrix. G and D are things that I need to know in order to configure my channel properly. And since this 
channel G is a line upside channel. It has a particular structure. In particular, it's given by a array response vector, which says that when a plane wave comes in from a, a given angle, if I know the phase shift uh, omega at the first element, I know automatically from geometry what the phase shift will be at all the other elements. This is the definition of an array response vector. You can find this for ULAs and for uh, uniform plane arrays and textbooks. And there will also be a challenge. So the gain, the phase shift at the first element, and the angle of arrival that is telling me what will be the phase shift on all the other elements, these are the unknown parameters. So now I'm not looking for just any channel G, not, it's just not any vector of dimension N, but it's a vector in the set A, which contains vectors of this kind. It can have any real valid gain, any phase shift, but the rest of it must be an array response vector. So we would like to find the most likely channel in this set. So the way that we worked before was that we were estimating the channel by maximizing the likelihood function, uh, which was the same as minimizing the squared norm of the received signal minus what we are expecting to get in the absence of noise. And in this case, it looked like this. But what we now are looking for is what is minimizing this in terms of G in this set of possible line of sight channels and D is just a coefficient, any channel. And we would like to minimize this. And in our paper that we are presenting on ICC this year, we have this long formulas for how to find this. So it builds upon classical maximum likelihood estimation methods, but it's tuned for this particular problem. There are four rows here where we can compute the phase shift and the path losses that minimizes um, uh, this norm here. The most important thing is that there is one row here that is determining what we think is the angle of arrival. And this needs to be solved numerically while the other ones are in uh, closed form. But this numerical search is just a computation in the computer. We can make this as dense grid search as we like because we can use the same pilots for, for these computational times. So it's just a computational effort. Once we have computed these estimates, we can compute an achievable rate. So this is how the achievable rate looks like in general. Log two are one plus transmit power divided by noise power. And then we have this absolute value square. And I had this expression summation over the different elements before. Now I add a direct path D and my configuration might not be optimal anymore, but what I would like to configure it as is to cancel out the phase shift from contained in HG and GN. I know HN, but I estimate GN from here. So I, I assign that phase shift and then I have the direct path as well. And I would like all of these N paths to match with its uh, phase shift. So that's why I am taking the estimate of D and take its argument as well. All right, so we can do this and we can compute things. However, one question remains, what pilot should we transmit in order to implement and use this uh, maximum likelihood estimator? And the conventional approach that is used in general is that we predefined some set of pilots we want to transmit. The typical thing I've been to send some in different angular directions. You can use a DFT matrix to transmit a certain angular direction. So some people got turn on and off elements, whatever that really means in practice and you go through them and then you compute an estimate of your channels and then you're done uh, and you run your system. But we would like to minimize number of pilots. So we would like to transmit as few as possible and we can't really know in advance which ones we need to send in order to get the good estimate uh, because we don't gonna uh, explore all dimensions. So we are then considering a more dynamic approach where we first need to look broadly we transmit two pilots. So we receive a uh, receive pilot signal of dimension two. I call L is equal to two. Then I compute a maximum likelihood estimate uh, in the way that I described in the previous slide. And this maximum likelihood estimate might not be perfect. And the goal is not that it should be perfect with only two pilots. But 
it tells us something about where we think that the channel is. And we can now send a third pilot inspired by where we think that the user is, what was we think that was the true channel. So for example, suppose I have an RS here and I send uh, pilots using RS configuration that will pick up signal in dimension one, dimension two. And after that, I compute an estimate of the channel and I think, oh, I think the channel came from here. Well, then in the next step, I send a new pilot and I configure my RS in a way that matches well with where I think the channel was. And now two things can happen. Either I figure out that my uh, the channel wasn't at all in this direction. It's like, I think it's over there, let's look there. And then I saw, oh no, there was nothing there. The user wasn't there. Uh, so now I will find an entirely new estimate. Or I look there and I see that the user was actually there. I improve my uh, reliability in the estimates much. And uh, now I, it matches much better with the data and therefore I, uh, have a better and better estimate. And this kind of loop here between computing a good estimate, look for something that is uh, where I either think the channel is or where would be the second best option. Uh, this dynamic approach here quickly converges. And I will show you how that happens in a moment. Um, so here is one illustration of how this might look like in two dimensions where we are searching in different angular directions. And the function is the one on the previous slide here that was saying I should search for angles in certain directions. And this is db scale because there's a large dynamic range. At time two, my guess is that the angle came from this direction. And, and then I send a new pilot that is matching with this direction. And I figure out, no, the user wasn't there. Now my new guess is that it's over here. Look there, send new pilots uh, as if the user was there and you see, no, the user wasn't there. Okay, let's have another one. And then after five occasions here, it converges. And after that, I never change my mind again because I found the user. And there's a huge amount of directions that I never explore because I realized that I don't need to look there because the user wasn't there. And I could see that already from my maximum likelihood estimator because that one is telling me a few possible direction where the user might be, but it also excludes a lot of dimensions. So here's a simulation example how that works. I have an array with eight by eight elements. They are quarter wavelengths based. We have a rather low SNR of the channels uh, and also for the pilot transmissions of zero dB. Uh, and before I configured things, it's like per element, it is minus 10 dB. I have created an environment with a five by five room we put this RES on, on the wall and we move around in the room and the elevation angle and the azimuth angle can change. And here is the average spectral efficiency for different locations in the room. And here I'm showing the number of pilots that I'm transmitting up to 64. Because if I send 64 pilots, then I have explored all dimensions. The top curve here is the uh, spectral efficiency I can achieve with perfect channel state information. If I configure my RS perfectly, then I get this value all the time. If I use this classical least square estimator, which is also some kind of maximum likelihood estimator, but it's not the one exploiting the line of sight properties, then I get this blue curve. And the problem is that the, there is a capacity gap here that is uh, quite large until we reach the point where we are transmitting as many pilots as there are elements here. So that's why you can't really use such an estimator until you have sent enough pilots. Our proposed method is to start with the, the black curve here, which is that we're looking in two random dimensions, directions first. And then we run this dynamic approach where we are looking for new directions in a systematic manner until we find a good estimate. And in this case, we are after maybe uh, six, seven, eight, nine uh, pilots instead of 64, we have actually reached very close capacity. And finally, if we also have a sense of where the user was before, because the user is moving around in the room. So even if the user is moving randomly, we don't have any model of where the user is moving or how it is moving. If one of my, 
pilot transmissions is to direct the signal from the direction where the user was the last time, then we converge even faster. So to wrap up now, channel estimation is really essential in RS data communication. In the elementary case where we have, we need n pilots, which is equal to the number of RS elements, or even n plus one. And I don't think this is practical in mobile communication scenarios where you want people to be able to move around. Maybe you can make it work in some fixed wireless scenarios. So what can we do to deal with this? Well, one solution is to sacrifice a bit of the beamforming gain, but still keep the aperture gain of the RS. So we are dividing the RS into subarrays with identical configurations. The simulation result I was showing was for a worst case, uh, yeah, really fading scenario. If you have some line of sight scenarios together with this, there might be even better ways where you don't lose as much as we were doing. Um, but you can tune the pilot length to the data packet size so that you are figuring out how much effort would you like to, uh, to have on configuring the RES, spending pilot power and resource on that one, uh, and how much, uh, so that you improve your SNR compared to just transmitting with uh, a roughly designed RES uh, and transmit with a slightly higher power, but for a shorter period of time. And the second solution is to exploit structure, geometry, such as a parametrization of the channel, because we will probably have scenarios mostly where you have line of sight channels to and from the RS. And then we can design the kind of parametric maximum likelihood estimators that tries to estimate the unknown part of the channel from the user to the RS. And if we apply this dynamic pilot approach where we are not predefining what pilot dimensions we would be looking in, but we are basing that on our estimates, we can send much fewer pilots than that. And what I've been presenting today is some joint work with uh, my colleagues, uh, Shishik Anders, Parisa, Methi, and Aslim, that I uh, would like to acknowledge. And these are my funding agencies that have also enabled me to work on this exciting topic in the past few years. So with that, here is the list of the configuration or the, the papers that I've been mentioning. Uh, the last two papers are recent papers that you can both find on archive. So if you want to take a screenshot now, do that. And uh, I hope you want to, to read these papers. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Biasa. Thanks a lot for your uh, interesting talk. I see many people got answer how we can use the race in the practical scenario. Now let's go to the q and I think we got uh, many questions here. Let's go one by one. Hmm? The first one is like, uh, uh, okay, someone asked for the presentation slides. So it's possible to share with us after the talk. Right, so, so I will be happy to, to, to share the, the slides. And I, since this, uh, I guess the talk is recorded uh, yeah. and uh, it will be available somewhere as well. Okay, yeah. And the second one is like, uh, in, I think in the uh, first two, in the second slide, you are mentioning about the, uh, uh, you have one norm in this uh, Cauchy SWAT upper band when you calculate the received single strength. So someone think uh, it should be two norm. I think it should be one norm, I agree with you. Right, so, so the, uh, it is uh, a very good point. So it is correct that it's the one norm, but I was somewhat vague when I was referring to the Cauchy Schwarz uh, uh, bound because normally that is something that gives you a two norm. But here there is a specific requirement that this RAS vector, um, every element needs to have unit modulus. So we, we can't change the amplitude of them. We can only change the phase shift. So that's why it eventually turns into be one norm. And in this uh, paper one here, the SBM paper, uh, well, I'm showing how you use the cautious uh, but inequality to reach this result. So I recommend searching for that statement there when you find the mathematical detail. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you can follow your, your paper for more details. The third one is like uh, for the system model of a uh, risk system, the first shifter, the first shifter vector seems to have a square of a square root of n norm. Does this mean that the risk has a gain? 
Right. So, so this is this aperture again that I was mentioning later on in the presentation. Uh, uh, so, so what does gain mean here? Well, it, it really means that every element have a certain physical size. So, when an electrical uh, uh, field is reaching it, it will, uh, yeah, you integrate over the area of the the, the element to figure out what fraction of the electric. Uh, the wave that you are, are gathering and the larger the surface is, the more energy you can collect. Uh, so from that perspective, it, it has a gain, but it's not like it's amplifying the signal. It's more like, yeah, larger elements or larger number of elements is capturing more energy. Okay, yeah. So the next one is like, do you know how the risk gain related to the gain of a surface in antenna design? I think it's more related to the hardware of the antenna. Right. So uh, I'm not a hardware designer, but I, I would say that uh, you can typically view each element here as being a patch antenna and design them in similar methods like this. So the, then the difference is that you are not uh, connecting this patch antenna to a uh, a radio unit that is generating your signal, but the signal is rather coming from there, and then it is getting reflected because you terminate your your uh, your antenna, so you get as close to a total reflection as possible. But in general, you want these elements to be physically small, should design in small patches, so that each element acts almost like an isotropic antenna that is sending out the signal dimensions, and then you use these phase shifts in order to control the directivity over there. Okay, thanks. The next one is like uh, um, regarding the uh, geometry of the risk element. So the current research primary focus on the equinatory square shapes. We believe this is merit in investigating alternative ge geometric shapes for that element. So it's like uh, in terms of the shapes, so it's a square at this moment. So. Do you also recommend, like uh, for the design, we consider other type of shape for the risk element? Um, I don't um, have a, a strong opinion about how one should design the shape of this element. So I would say that the, the most important thing is that each element have a radiation pattern that is rather uniform in all the directions where you might ever like Darius to reflect signals so that you can then control the, because you create the beam forming from the Darius by, uh, yeah, constructive interference from, from the phase shifts. So, so from that perspective, you, uh, you want the element to not have a preferred directivity. You want to create a directivity yourself. So whatever design of elements that leads to roughly uniform gain in all the directions that are of interest to you would be good enough for me. Thanks, thanks, yeah. The next, we have many, many questions left. Maybe I will pick uh, one or two. And uh, the next one is like, uh, uh, the, uh, the audience asking you, have you compared your presented strategy with a hierarchical code book best beam search? So which one do you think uh, is less uh, complex? So it's like uh, for the uh, quarter book design right there. So there is a trend that we consider multiple layer quarter book in order to reduce the, uh, the, uh, the training time. So. Right, so I don't see the, so this is a, there is certainly a, a close connection between uh, doing this kind of, of beam searches in millimeter wave uh, hybrid beam forming compared to doing this with RES. Uh, so the problem with the hierarchical code books is also that you um, are, uh, you, you're spending quite some time on, on building things up so that you will save th things later on. Uh, so we haven't made an exact comparison to this because I don't see how it isn't in my mind as straightforward to do this as it might seem uh, be because of the different uh, kind of system. 
models here and the fact that we are with this maximum likelihood estimator we are finding things that not necessarily matches with a particular beam so we, we might be uh, uh, yeah, design the RS to reflect the signal in a particular direction, and then we don't see anything. Do we just throw it away? Well, no, it might tell us, uh, well, there should have been a side lobe there, but there is no side lobe there. Therefore, we can change our mind about how, how the, uh, the where the actual channel was. So um, I would believe that we are gaining things from this, but uh, it is something that we, we would like to compare against, but it's not obvious how to do it. Yeah, I think uh, also, especially, I mean, if there are some hardware constraints in order to design this, uh, and with a large number of uh, loose elements, probably it's uh, too challenging to find some uh, some uh, suboptimal or close to optimal beam pattern for the hierarchical mm -hmm. concept. Let's have one left. We can take one or two more. This one is like, uh, do you think uh, it's possible to use other estimator, such as a compressive sensing based method instead of a traditional methods like a maximum likelihood estimator? Yes, uh, I think so. So uh, the uh, we were using the, the traditional uh, maximum likelihood estimator here as just the first step on things, but I think one can certainly use this type of things. And in our paper, uh, I, I think we also have it in paper four here, we are referencing a nice IEEE, uh, proceedings of IEEE paper by Lee Swindlehurst and his collaborators who are going through a number of different channel estimators for, for different RIA scenarios, including some compressive sensing methods. So, so yes, uh, I think this is a good idea. To, I think what is described in that paper is not necessarily those that are aimed as here to get away with as few pilots as possible, but with enough pilots, how do we get the best estimate? That is a little bit more how they are, are, are approaching it. Uh, but yeah, there are such approaches. And okay. I think that makes sense. Okay, I also want to ask one question. I guess I will stop uh, looking at the Q&A box. So in your slides, you mentioned, uh, I mean, two scenarios, like it's uh, one is like uh, strong frequency selective, another one is uh, weak frequency selective. I see some gains like uh, in the weak, uh, weak frequency selective scenario with a risk compared to the case without risk. But uh, for the uh, for the strong, I mean, for the strong frequency selective scenario, we didn't see any gain. I mean, with a risk and without a risk. Yes, I, I was uh, refer referring to this one. So what the, the uh, reason behind is uh, because of uh, beam squid or what the uh, issue to what, what are the reasons uh, causing this? Uh, this uh, we don't have any gain with the risk compared to the case without the risk. Right. So, so here there are a few things that are interacting. So, so one thing is that mm -hmm. we are um, uh, we configure. So we have a frequency selectivity, so we can configure. They are yes, very nice for one mm -hmm. subcarrier, but then it's not necessarily very well matched for the other subcarriers. Uh, so okay. that's uh, so so it's sort of that extra subcarrier that, that is keeping being slightly better for a while here. Then the other aspect is also that um, when we hear uh, in the way that we, we model channels based on free to people models, that when we were taking away the line of sight path, uh, mm -hmm. we it turns out that this direct channel between the transmitter and the receiver, even if it's weak, turns out to be relatively speaking stronger now. Yeah. So w the RES isn't big enough to actually make a big difference. So even if it adds uh, some extra power relative to what you already got over direct path, it's not as uh, influential anymore. So, so that is another effect that is happening here. And I think it's illustrative of things that whenever I see an RS paper that uh, is not including a direct path, e mm -hmm. even a weak, very weak one, I mm -hmm. get very suspicious. That is when you see papers ending up with, oh, with 10 elements, we get this great performance. But uh, mm -hmm. I think you typically need hundreds of elements before it actually becomes practically useful because otherwise even an extremely weak direct path Will be stronger than the RS. Yes, yes. Well, thanks. Yeah, I think now I understand. And uh, also another, I have another question. 
So like uh, for the channel estimation, right? Like uh, when we deploy a race, usually we 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 know where the race is located. So that's why. Mm -hmm. I mean, in this sense, we we know partially or almost closer to perfect the name. We know the uh, channel between the race and the, the base station. So in this sense, I think uh, we can take this advantage to somehow simplify the channel estimation or even reduce the uh, training overhead. What do you see? Right. Uh, exactly. And, and that was uh, what we were doing here when we were assuming that the H channel is known. Uh, oh, okay. So then we are taking that into account. Then uh, so what you're saying makes perfect sense. I, I agree with it. But then I think in practice, it might still not be entirely easy to, to estimate this H here because uh, where should the signal come from? Maybe one needs to still assume that there is a line of sight channel here so that you have a possibility of uh, yeah, measuring angles or you need to put the user here that sends the signal and measure it in the deployment phase. But yeah, it makes good sense to, to assume that you know H, I think, to, to simplify things. So that's what we did here. I see, I see, yeah. Thanks a lot. I think uh, that's all for today. And uh, looking forward to seeing you in person and uh, have a discussion face to face. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the people who were, were watching this online. And I see that there is a number of questions that I didn't have time to answer, but please ask them as comments to some RES video on YouTube and I will make sure to, yeah. to answer them there instead. We will upload the, the video and uh, yeah, people can also go there and ask questions. Thanks. Have a nice day.